All right, today's little project, a Pioneer amplifier and some AAP by Phil Jones speakers. Look at these monsters, really, really, really can't wait to give these things a bit of a, a cranking. Pull the covers off, ho, ho, ho. very, very, very tidy. So looking forward to that. But more immediate concerns. This Pioneer HDMI 2K amp is a VSX919AH and bought it with a remote, didn't pay a lot for it, thought I got the bargain of the century, but press the buttons, nothing happens. And if you turn this around, some of these buttons work, you can see the little LED flashing in the middle, but if I press the remote for example, uh, the remote volume, nothing happens, if I press it really firmly, come on, there we go, so it's working, but it works with a very, very firm press. The power button doesn't work. Some of the other buttons do work. So what I'm going to have to do is dismantle. There we go. Some work, like the, the central four-way controller works. Return button works. Setup button works. Some of these center buttons work. But I'd say the touchpad, the carbon touchpad behind here is, is jiggered. So I can't turn this on with the remote. Power on. All good. Now, this does work. You can hear that working. But I've also got problems with the volume knob not working. Also, the function knob you can see in there, that's been sort of shattered off, so I'm gonna to have to 3D print or work out how to repair that. I can turn this down with the remote if I press the, the remote button really, really hard. So basically, this is not a potentiometer. It's not a variable resistor, it's a rotary encoder. What that means is there are tabs on the inside that pick up the number of rotations and they transfer that via a little logic control circuit into a volumetric change. So that's how these work. This amp, I'll go through it when I get it working. I think it's a really, really nice amp. Basically, it's a seven channel, 120 watt per channel. It's got a, a, a few pretty neat features. It's a, I think they were released in 2009, 2010. They've got a lot of features. They've got uh, B speakers or second zone with uh, second source for second zone, which is pretty cool. They've got, uh, if I rotate that around, so Blu-ray disc, you've got heaps of different decoding modes, Dolby ProLogic 2, ProLogic Standard, Neo 6 Cinema, which is re-encoding a two-channel signal into a 5.1 or a 7.1 signal, Neural THX. So this also has a plug-in microphone. So that's the MCACC setup mic. This was the cheapest amplifier or second cheapest amplifier at the time that Pioneer released that had this setup mic. Almost every amplifier that I've had a look at and tested has had a setup mic functionality, which is basically Denon, Yamaha, those sorts of higher level brands, even uh, my friends at Sony. So I'm gonna power this thing down and pull apart the amp. I'm trying to get the remote working first and I'll see, show you how to do that. This one should be pretty straightforward. Looks like there's a Phillips head in the back. Good old two double A's and I'll try and get the remote working. Then I'll work on the rotary encoder. And soon enough, <laughs> I thought I'll sell this and make a quick buck, but it's bitten me in the bum. All right, so first step, often when you pull these remotes apart, they click apart. Oh, battery's out, that would help, wouldn't it? Look, at least the contacts aren't corroded, which is a nice change. Normally these are corroded to buggery when you get a remote like this. Ten years old, people put dissimilar batteries in them. Don't ever do that, as in an alkaline with a non-alkaline. Tiny little screw. So I'm hoping that with a screw, oh good, there's one at the back as well, because the ones that are, that are click and press to get them together are extremely, not so much difficult to get apart, but when you put them back together, or, or you, you damage them, I should say, when you try and get them apart. So this may or may not be the same. Yeah, it's not looking good. So normally to open one of these, you, if you want to wreck your case, you slide a screwdriver along the side and, and sort of wiggle it in and most people use what they call a spudger tool. Don't know what the etymology of the word spudger is, like bludger and spade or <laughs> something like that. But anyway, a spudger tool is sort of a flat edge that you can force in the ed in the, into the crack here. This Pioneer is not giving me any, and I'm really pushing that quite hard, uh, yeah it is Pioneer, is not giving me any leeway at all. So I'm going to have to work out how I can crack this baby open without smashing it and without accidentally severing a, a limb. But it is just so incredibly stiff. So I'm just gonna have to really work out how this is gonna come apart without damaging it. 
because if you break off the little insertion clips on the inside then they're loose and they don't go back together properly there we go oh my god that is tight so I've got a blade in the end and I'm going to work all the way around with some little jeweler's screwdrivers and crack this open once you get one open yeah okay there we go oh, oh dear that is a horrible sound it's the sound of plastic cracking I haven't seen any other videos on YouTube on how to pull apart this remote so there you go this is going to be a video on how to pull apart this remote as well there you, go, you can see that's open it's getting there getting there getting there come on come on pescado andiamo yo necesito un poquito ayuda si sí, pero is muy peligroso unclicked on one side the other side so I'm actually applying a bit of lateral pressure here oh, come on you're almost there gosh I've never seen such a, a, a remote that's so difficult to get apart but I've got it apart great look at that now a bit just came flying out so these are all the bits oh a little encoder there's the um, there's the transmission LED yeah contacts look okay and normally 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 these things are full of hair and bits of skin and their and fingernails and they're just beyond foul so and you can clean them up with IPA isopropyl alcohol and yeah this one is typically bad so I'll give it a clean uh, I'll wash it out you can see here that it's pretty dirty telltale signs of 10 years of treatment and hiding behind the couch so all I'm using is a little bit of any cream cleanser will do all these components and a little bit of mild detergent now I did photograph the layout of all the keys so that I know where everything goes when I put this bad boy back together so the next step this is the back of the board I've got some isopropyl alcohol so IPA is always the first step if it still doesn't work then we'll have to look at carbon contacts or you can put aluminium foil on the back of the press buttons but these press buttons are so tiny that I don't think that is going to work you can buy complete working replacements of this remote for about $35 it all comes down to what I think that's worth to me try this off reassemble test all right it's all dry so reassemble now these have got tabs so that they only go in one way just check this the enter button so it doesn't go in upside down top one just gently press those in tidy that up in a second the bottom one make sure you've got the four these four plastic buttons on the right way this is the selector switch so that has to go can only go one way like that slide see that and then this matches so so I'm using my trusty power supply three volts DC which is what we know it is positive is this one over here so it's negative and positive because it says so there plus gently turn this thing over I've got this powered up and the same buttons work as before press that as hard as I like and I'm just not getting any joy out of that button so I'm stuck I might have to either look at recontacting this recarboning those contacts uh, using some aluminium foil or buying a replacement remote the cleaning did basically nothing so all these contacts are pretty clean but nothing worked so as in nothing was improved so what I've done I've got a little stick here with a tiny bit of foil on it and what I'm going to try and do is to use this to bridge contacts out and see if I can see with a phone which doesn't have an infrared filter just to see if I get a spark of life because what I'm trying to work out is if the chip in the remote is busted or if it's just a problem with the contacts if it's just a problem with the contacts I can get a carbon kit and change these pads out on the back row so I've powered up the remote with my power supply again and I've got my little foil connection here if I connect these see that so this proves that it works so the remote is okay so it proves that the remote is okay but the carbon contacts on the back are stuffed last option is to clean using a uh, an earbud or what some people call a q-tip it's going to clean the back of these carbon contacts with IPA basically I've got this uh, clamped so that and I've got a spacer there so that clamps not pushing down on the buttons so you can sort of see what I've done there so this is just jury rigging this up and the idea is to see if I press and hold if I get a light and I do so that's the power button 
volume is still very difficult to press but I don't know that I can get away from that. You can put aluminium foil behind them and it looks like most of these work. That's the start. I can put this back together with some confidence now. So reassembly is pretty straightforward. Just have to make sure that all these buttons are fully inserted. Now I've given the volume buttons another bit of a clean because they just weren't going in properly. And you'll find that putting this back together is a bit of a two-part process. So you have to fold that in like that. And you can see, even though I've been very, very careful, I've still managed to snap this, uh, this front clip off here. So it's extremely fragile and easy to break. Got to make sure that the divider piece for the spring for the two AA batteries is in place. And basically, this just presses together. Each time you pull it apart, you're going to break something more off it. Make sure the main and zone 2 switch works. You go, looking a million bucks compared to what it looked like yesterday. Put these two screws back, fore and aft. Bob's your uncle. Now you always rotate it anti clockwise. Hear that little click? It's when the threading is seated. Otherwise, you'll cut new threads and you'll strip them. So don't do that. Okay, moment of truth. So I've got the rebuilt remote here and it's plugged in and we'll just see if we get this to tune, turn on via the remote. Haha, <laughs> and it works. So I'll select, select a couple of different sources. CD, it's working. Tuner, working. Now, imp all important volume controls. Beautiful. Oh, fantastic. I've cracked it. Fix this remote. That's really, really good. Now, proofs in the pudding. Turn it off. Woohoo! Nice. Done. Now, work on this rotary encoder. So this is the function control knob, and you can see it's broken. So I've just got a bit of leftover wooden dowel that I'm going to drill out and make a sleeve, basically, and then slip it in. Just kept going up in half mil sizes, and I found a 9 mil bit is perfect, and that lets me put a sleeve over it. Now I've found another piece of dowel, and I've cut a little cord that fits in. And I'll glue that in and that will become my new piece and I can just keep filing that flat until it fits. Alright, so that's the finished product. Okay, finished. Righto, two jobs. The first one is to see if my homemade little volume control or, or function control has worked. So, that is beautiful. I took this one off so that I could check it out, but I'm not going to put this one on because the next job is to pull this rotary encoder out and fix it. Never trust anyone that says that the amp works perfectly. All I did was power it on and show me the display. What a tweet. Right, all the screws are out. Power is off and unplugged. And let's see what we got in here. The rotary encoder is going to be behind there. So I'm going to have to pull this front panel off. I've actually got a cooling fan in here and I did hear that spin up uh, a little bit earlier. A bit of Pioneer. Wank direct energy power amplifier, yeah. All our encoding chips, NEC decoding chips, a few other bits and pieces, Dolby DTS chip up here. So this is where all the magic happens. And obviously, yeah, as I said, cooling fan there, quite unusual, but it is seven times 120 watts, so it's got a fair bit of heft, this thing. It's just that the volume doesn't work, so it's totally useless. This has a whole stack of screws along the bottom there. So you've got to take all of those out. Okay, so the top one of these is quite easy to get out. You just have to get a, a very thin blade screwdriver in behind this tab. The bottom one, I'm using a sharpened nail to try and get in underneath and to lever that out. Right, once the, all the bottom screws are out, and I mean all of them, you can lift these tabs up and the whole thing should slide forward. Yep. You're going to have to pull off some of these cables though. So another thing that's got to come off is this ribbon cable on this side here. Just lever out this connection. Okay, so w wiggle this one out gently, walk it up each side until it pops off. And then when you've got those two out and that ribbon cable out, this can come out at least enough. That's hanging down by some other cables at the front there. It's at least enough so you can get into the rotary encoder, which is obviously on this side here. So all I'm doing is systematically going around and undoing all of these little screws 
like so. And once they're all out, you can get to the back of the rotary encoder. There are plastic clips, clips around the perimeter. All right, you can see that all of the screws are taken out. Now, the other thing that you'll see, which I discovered with some disgust, is that the rotary encoder, and there she blows, is basically hard soldered onto the board. It's not a separate component. It's held on by these two hefty soldered lugs there. So I'm going to have to desolder those. And once they're desoldered using desoldering copper strapping, I'm going to have to pull the front of the encoder off and see if I can repair it. Great, nice work, Piney. A stupid idea. Righto, so we're ready to do the deed. I'm just going to show you the points of interest. So we've got to unsolder this tab and this tab. They're the main support tabs. Then one, two, three terminals. Always use a little bit of solder just to start you off. So the trick here is to get a little flat blade screwdriver and just put it underneath the rotary encoder. And then when you flip it over, what you want to do is get your iron and just heat each tab up one by one. Put a little bit of downward pressure and out it comes. Voila, one rotary encoder. This actually looks in pretty good condition, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to bend these tabs up extremely gently to try and create a little bit more clutch with the rotary encoder, and that will be all I can really do, because it just doesn't look dirty at all. There we go. Now, reassemble. Try it out. Do it all in reverse. So just put that back together. All right. That's all I can do. So that's done. It's all soldered up. Now I just have to reassemble the whole thing and see if it worked. Right, now everything's plugged back in, so I'm going to hit the soft on. Oh, power on. Awesome. So, now if I turn this, is it going to do anything? Ha ha ha! I fixed it. I fixed it. Awesome. Now I've got to properly reassemble this, and job's done. Brilliant. That is such good news. Alright, so I'm just going to do a little bit of a walk around of this amp, this uh, Pioneer VSX919AH. So this was released in 2009, cost about 700 Australian dollars. It wasn't the top of the line, but it was close. Uh, it's full HD, it upscales to full HD. It's not 4K, so that's something to note, it's not 4K. It's a 5.1 system. And as if you want second zone, you can have second zone at 5.1, or you can have it as a 7.1 without second zone speakers. It says that it puts out 120 watts out of seven channels, which is quite a lot. It's actually got a cool. Oh. <laughs> it's got a cooling fan on the amplifier heatsink, and I'll show you a photo of that. You know, it's got nine equalization bands, six memory calibration presets. It does a lot of uh, fairly clever stuff. It's got automatic speaker calibration, which I'm, I'll run through in a second. It's got uh, ProLogic, DTS HD, Master Audio, DTS Express, 96 kilobit decoding, Neo 6, and DTS PCM pulse code modulation up to 7.1 channels. And it's got Neural THX, so, which is sort of an automatic adjustment of the sand field. You've got USB input at the front, you've got uh, composite video and left-right analog, and if we come around to the back, we've got one, two, three HDMI inputs. Uh, we've got some composites, we've got some component, and we've got some analog inputs as well. The speaker binding terminal posts are quite close together, so getting 12 gauge wire in there is a, a little bit tedious. 
got input for 75 ohm FM, pretty standard, and a loop AM antenna. Basically, it doesn't have S-Video support, if that's important to you. It's got second zone uh, controls and, and remote inputs. Now, the biggest gripe I've got with this stereo is not necessarily the amplifier itself. It's with this remote. They are the master volume control buttons, and basically, they're almost no bigger than the rest of the buttons on the remote. So, apart from this one being quite difficult to press because the carbon on the back of the buttons is stuffed, uh, which is pretty poor for a you know basically a, only a 10 year old receiver a lot of these are second function buttons so anything that you can see in blue there is a second function a lot of it's for things like ipod control which this does have a dedicated ipod control which if you're an apple universe person that's a good thing but generally you got a little switch here for main and second zone control you can program this remote and do things like that but generally this remote is pr pretty crap i've got to say now this does have uh, something that Pioneer calls MCACC, which is their automatic room calibration feature. So let's try that out. I'm just going to plug in. This is actually an Odyssey mic uh, from Denon, but any 3.5mm mic will work. I've plugged that in. It basically says, yep, I'm, I'm ready to go. So I'm going to press enter, which is start. So at the end of that, it tells me that the center and the surround right are reverse phase, so let's change those around and I'll do the test again. Now I've changed the phase on these twice and now it says left is reverse phase and surround right which has been changed is reverse phase. Now that's not the case so I'm going to go to go next and basically bypass this because the amplifier is wrong. Righto, so that's done. So it's gone through its MCACC, Advanced Calibration, whatever MCACC, MCAC, whatever that sounds like. It sounds like a government, government body to spend your money. It's all calibrated, and now by the way, the speakers I'm using to test are some Phil Jones. These things are astonishing, and they're magnificent. So Phil Jones speakers uh, were basically audiophile quality, Studio monitors uh, is what Phil Jones specialised in in the States. These are probably made in China, but they're certainly uh, beautifully fabricated and very, very heavy. And so that's the centre, 100 watt, and they're just astonishing, absolutely beautiful. So this is the basically the display that you get. I'm just pressing these buttons on the amp to flick through the modes. You've got the advanced check. Uh, allows you to check variations of the memory and transmit data. So basically, speaker settings, uh, surround back, no. So that's for 7.1 subwoofer. I don't have a subwoofer connected at the moment. You can check channel levels. So that's from the automatic equalization. Check your distances. So it goes down to the centimeter, which is good. This is the equalization that you can set up. So it's quite advanced. Uh, so you've got different equalization curves for different speakers that you can see on the screen there, which is actually something I've never seen before. It looks like it's only for center and main. And again, if you want to bring up your bass, you can. You've got all sorts of level control. And that's basically all you've got in terms of the, the remote control on the screen. Very, very frustratingly, if I'm listening to the tuner, and I'll show you what I mean. If, I'm listening, if you're listening to the tuner on the amplifier, this does not come up on the screen as I'm changing volume level. So there's no real interface between what's happening on the uh, amplifier and what's happening on the screen. So if I press mute or if I press a function here, it doesn't translate to an on-screen display. So one parting shot. So this has been on maybe minus 30 dB, so pretty low volume level. And it is warm. Like it is properly, properly warm. The cooling fan is not running, but it, I did hear it spool up a little bit earlier, but I'm surprised how hot this is getting. So basically, I did have the center speaker resting on here, but I've moved it back so that the grill is, is open, but that's quite disappointing. That is a lot of heat coming out of that amplifier, and it's only been on for about half an hour just doing this test.